context in our life situations. We are looking at Lot, David, and Daniel. Firstly, in the case of Lot, we, we know where Lot's decisions landed him. Lot left home with Abraham. I don't believe he was invited. God invited Abraham to take a journey. And many, as, it, as is the case so many times, you have people who tag along. And Lot was tagging along with Abraham. And he participated in the blessings that God bestowed upon Abraham, even though he was just tagging along. And many times, folks, we can, we can be blessed if we tag along with the right people. But Lot was not changed by the blessings he received, at least not as much as he needed to be. We find that uh, in, beginning in Genesis 13, verses 10 and 11, no need to look it up. I'm going to go through several texts. I'm going to give you the references, and you can look them up later on, if you would. Lot chose all the plain of Jordan. When conflict arose between him and, and Abraham, rather than taking the, the high road and saying, look, I really don't belong here. I know that God called you and he has been blessing you. I have been fortunate to be in your presence and along with you. When Abraham gave him the opportunity to make a choice, Lot got greedy. He looked around and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was beautiful, it, it was very fertile, and, and you had cities there, there were cultural opportunities there, and Lot chose it all. He didn't just say, look, you know, you take half of the bad stuff and I'll take half of the good stuff and that kind of thing. He just took all the good, at least so he thought. It all looked like good to him. We know what happened to Lot. Lot experienced war, kidnapping, had to be rescued by the same person that he essentially cheated, Abraham. He, ex he experienced oppression and torment by the ungodly citizens of Sodom. You find that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He experienced the loss of all his possessions, what he took to Sodom and Gomorrah and what he made while he was there. Sometimes decisions look as though, on the face of it, at the beginning, as though they're good decisions. But only God could lead us to make the right decisions. Not only did he lose his possessions, he lost his wife. And then, of course, we had the incidents of uh, incest with his daughters, producing the Moabites and the Ammonites, who were thorns in the flesh of God's people for many, many generations. Moving on quickly to David. We know that David chose to commit adultery with Bathsheba, and as a consequence, he suffered the death of his infant son, 2 Samuel 12, a daughter molested by her half-brother, the son killed by, his, uh, by her vengeful brother, and a rebellion led by that son who shamed him publicly and whose death brought further pain to him. Another decision that seemed like it was good at the time but didn't quite work out the way it should be. David, though, is an example of someone who made bad decisions, then repented and was restored, being called a friend of God. We had Lot. I don't know where he ended up. The, the record is pretty much silent after the incident with his daughters. But David, we know, repented, returned, and God restored him, and he, he is an example, in God's own words, of being a friend to God. Next, we have Daniel. Daniel is, is an example of a person choosing to make the right decision from the very beginning and sticking to his guns, so to speak. Not in his own strength, but certainly in the strength of God. Daniel was captured and taken into Babylonian captivity. He and his friends, we are told, purposed in their hearts that they would not defile themselves. In other words, 
these guys decided to be knotheads for God. They made a decision and nothing could dissuade them from those decision, the decision that they had made. Decisions they made prior to captivity. In other words, they didn't wait until there was um, difficulty. They did not wait until things got bad in order to, to make a right decision, as many of us do today. As times are good, we put off making a full commitment to God. We put off being fully available to God. Well, Daniel and his friends made themselves fully available to God. And wonderful things happened, such that when the king who had captured them got in difficulty, emotional difficulty, having a dream, he could not get out of his mind and he couldn't get interpreted. He had to turn to these captives who turned to their God. And God had a chance to be glorified through them because of their steadfast decision to allow God to be the Lord of their lives continually. Now, with Lot and Daniel and David illustrating the need for making wise decisions, let's take a look at some of the, a few of the choices, the life choices that tend to affect our lives. And we want to take also a look at uh, suggestions, one or two suggestions for making wise choices and what to do when, not if, but when we have made wrong choices. I know a few of you might be perfect and never make a wrong choice, but I, just speaking for myself, I know that I've made lots of wrong choices and uh, needed the mercy of God and still will continually need the mercy of God. For those of us who are imperfect, when we make a wrong, wrong decision, what should we do? First of all, I think that we need, I don't think, I know, that we need to make the one decision that is fundamental to all other decisions. What's that decision? Anyone? Follow Christ? Anyone else? I thought I would hear a whole chorus. Beg your pardon? Accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior? Okay, good. All right. Now, thank you, and uh, you'll get your plaques at the, end of, uh, at the end of the service. The rest of you, I don't know. The fundamental choice that we all have to make, the fundamental decision that we need to make is to allow Jesus to be the Lord of all life. In other words, to connect with him, be yoked with him. We've heard illustrations. Uh, we no longer use um, uh, yokes in this country, I don't think. But back in the early days, in the 1700s, 1800s, I guess, um, we still used animals. I grew up seeing animals being yoked together. They are usually like-sized animals, and on the rare occasion, you would find one that was a smaller animal being yoked to a larger one if the younger one was being trained. Well, picture in your minds for a moment as God being the larger animal. I know it's, it's a limited type of illustration, and we being the smaller, weaker animal who needs training. If, we, if that smaller animal breaks away from the older animal, it never gets trained. If we break away from Christ and his yoke, which he says is easy and light. Why? Because he's bearing all the burden. He says, bring your burdens to me because and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This one decision, the reason I say it's fundamental and foundational to everything else in our lives is the one that affects every other decision that we will ever make. Do you believe that? I trust you do. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, which means surrendering to Christ daily, which ensures that we do not die eternally. Does that make sense? 
surrendering daily, as the Apostle Paul says in, in his uh, letters, surrendering to Christ daily ensures that we do not die eternally, the second death. Most importantly, as we surrender to Christ, as we remain yoked with him, we become more like him. We grow in likeness to him and we have the privilege of spending eternity with him because we get to learn to like him more. We want to hang out a little more with him. We are told that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. One little girl illustrates that text in this way by saying that God and Enoch used to take walks every day and one day they discovered that they were closer to God's house and God says, well, why don't you come home with me? It's a childlike expression of our walk with God. As we get closer and closer to him, we want to spend all our time with him. So the first decision that we need to make is a decision to allow God to be the Lord of our lives. In modern parlance, allow God to be the boss of you. Allow God to be the boss of me, to guide and direct. Some of the other decisions I'm going to go over rather quickly, because if we get the first one, we will get all the rest. Choosing a career, even from a worldly standpoint, if, you, if, if you're not thinking about scripture, you're not thinking about eternity, choosing the right career is of great importance. It can make the difference between financial security and uh, obscurity. It could make the difference between financial disaster. And, well, I don't think there's any job security these days, uh, is there? Well, people used to talk about that. But it makes a big difference. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Didn't think I was going to go all day without giving you a text, eh? Matthew chapter 6. Could we get, up, up, get that up on the screen, please? This one is tied directly, once again, to the first decision that we need to make. Somebody read it for us. Hmm. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We are talking about careers and seek ye first. Does that really make any sense? Absolutely. Because if God cares about everything that we do, cares about everything that, and he has our best interest at heart, we are told that there is nothing that he is not concerned about, even the hairs on our head. He's concerned that some of us can't grow here. He's concerned about everything. So he's concerned about the career that we should have. And he can see the long term while we can barely see the very short term. Next, choosing a mate. Well, for some of us, some of, some of you, it's kind of too late, right? You've already chosen. <laughs> so we'll deal with you on the, on the back end where it says what to do if you make a wrong decision. I'm just kidding, sorry. This choice will determine a great extent the degree of one's, of one's happiness. Um, Adam didn't have a choice, but today, choosing a mate is absolutely essential, and in some cases, being choos chosen by. Make sure the right person chooses you, okay? The next one is choosing your friends. <clears throat> choosing your friends. Let's read Proverbs 17, verse 17. Proverbs 17, verse 17. Who's found that? Okay. So a friend, we are, we are being told here that a friend, a true friend, will be with you through thick and thin. A true friend does not disappear at the first sight of adversity the first thing that goes wrong. 
It doesn't mean that friends agree on everything, but certainly they would try to understand what's going on. And the text further says that in adversity, a friend sticks with you. So many people have been led down wrong, wrong paths because of their friends. That does not only happen in the world, it happens in the church. Because many times decisions are made, we make decisions to, to support certain things based on the fact that our friend might be involved or a family member might be involved. If we were to get the first choice, make the first decision where we choose God above all else, then we wouldn't have that problem. Uh, an evangelist recently said that, that people seem to be more concerned about whether they are offending others rather than whether what they are thinking and doing might offend God. If the first friend we select is God, he guides us in the choice of all our other friends and we can honor him at every turn. Here's another one, choosing where to live. Did you think that that's a big deal? You just find a house you like and a neighborhood you like and uh, you move in, right? Well, <laughs> Brother Lot thought he had the right neighborhood. He had the best neighborhood. A lot of great opportunities, great schools, great cultural opportunities, diverse activities, and we saw where he ended up. It appeared to be a great decision from a living standpoint for his family, from a business standpoint, everything lined up just fine. But if you look at Genesis 13, 13, you'd find that that was a very poor choice. We are not going to read that, but we understand from earlier on that that was clearly a very poor choice. I remember when um, my wife and I have lived, as some of you know, lived many places. <clears throat> when we were uh, looking to move to San Francisco, and by the way, we are not city people. We've never, neither of us grew up in a city, a big city, and we've never lived in a city except for the wonderful city of San Francisco. I love San Francisco. It's the only city I love. But even in that city, God had his hand in that move. We did not move there just because we wanted to. Everybody told us we were going to Sodom and Gomorrah and that we were, we were taking our children who were, I guess, were 10 to 12 around there at that time, that we were going to lose our children, etc. That was one of the most... Uh, uh, spiritual experiences that we had. We met wonderful, we met wonderful people, people who loved the Lord. Yes, we met some weird people too, but uh, a great high in our Christian experience. Wonderful, wonderful people. And God, knowing the kind of people that we were, that he created in us, we were living in San Francisco, but we were placed on a hill surrounded by acres and acres of trees. I know you wouldn't think that because you've seen pictures of San Francisco and you don't see any of that. But God found this one hill with acres of trees and we had as our friend many birds, raccoons, skunks, and assorted animals in the city of San Francisco. We bought books and we could look at migratory birds. So God cares about everything about us, including where we live making the right decision for it. We thrive and our children thrive. We were there for 11 years and enjoyed it. But for every reaction, for every, for every choice, for every decision, there are consequences. And when I say consequences, consequence tends to be a negative word. So maybe I should say consequences and benefits. A benefit is a consequence or a rising out of those uh, decisions as well. To increase the likelihood that our choices will have good consequences, we want to look at a few suggestions. Some we have already, um, we've already uh, mentioned or inferred. 
And the very first one, and rightly so, and that is to ask God for wisdom. Let's take a look at James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, very quickly. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. I guess we need to have some more uh, Bible studies so we can get to these texts a lot faster. What's that? Oh, there we go. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If you found it, go ahead and read, please. Five through eight. That was verse one. There you go. So we are told that if we want to make good decisions, if we want to make the best decisions, decisions that, that require the wisdom that comes only from God, that all we need to do is ask. Ask, but the text also adds that we need to persist. Persist in asking, not for God's benefit, but for ours. Because most of us are basically skeptical. Yes, we ask. And we, we like to try things. Okay, I'm going to try and ask and see what God does. So we ask once and say, see, I told you he's not going to do anything. So God wants us to endure and to persist so that we can be moved from where we are in our skepticism and truly be asking in faith. God wants to do for us that which that which we need. Not necessarily what we want, but that which we need so that we can make the very, very best decision. So we need to fill our prayers with request for wisdom. I know we are told to praise God and so on and so forth, and that is good, we should do that. But in our, in our prayers, we need to ask for wisdom because wisdom is the foundation of making wise decisions the best decisions of all. Secondly, we may wish to ask for advice from godly people. Now, not everybody would be a good mentor or a coach or uh, gives the best advice. There are some people you'd want to stay clear from. Clearly, what we are talking about here are godly people, people who have a close connection with God, and who gives counsel that is concurrent, counsel that is in agreement with God's word in every form. And finally, we ask God for, for guidance and wisdom. We bounce it off of godly people. And thirdly, we want to commit our choices to God. Psalms 37, let's give this to Psalms 37, verses 5 and 6. Psalms 37, verses 5 and 6. Commit our choices to God. So we ask for wisdom, we make our choices, we make our decisions, commit those decisions to God. Read that text, please. It's one that we need to read. Commit your way to the Lord. In other words, commit your decisions, commit your plans to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. That is, as, um, God works with us in accordance with his will. If we ask God for wisdom, we persist. He gives us wisdom. We are told that he's willing to give to us good gifts. The plans we make will be in harmony with his will 
and he would be happy to bring those to pass if we ask according to his will. So make our choices with the understanding that it's in accordance with God's will. Which means if we ask God to bless the plans if it's according to his will, if it's not in accordance with his will, we are asking him to maybe frustrate those plans or redirect us in a different direction and being willing to be redirected according to his will because his will is the best for us at all times because he cares for us. Now, <clears throat> there will be times when it becomes readily apparent if we didn't know before that we have made a poor choice or even a wrong one because God wants us to make the absolute very best choice. What can we do to avoid making matters worse? In other words, if, it's, if the chickens are already out of the coop, don't send the dogs after them. If the cows are out of, <laughs> out of the barn, don't send the dogs after them. Would be a poor choice. For those of you who grew up on a farm, I did not, but I, it sounds like an applicable. Don't make things worse. We can learn from the mistakes of others, first of all. Do what Lot did. At least he did one good thing. He allowed himself to be taken out of Sodom. So listen to what God's word says and flee. Now we are told to flee temptation. This is one time when, when running away is the macho thing to do. You know, some of us like to think about, well, I can stand up against. But as we have learned and are learning continually in the great controversy, we are no match. We are not a player. We are not one of the big guys. All we can do is choose which side we are going to be on and run from the other guys. Is that clear? So to run away is a good thing in this context. Secondly, we can, we can heed God's word. Do what you know to be right without reservation. Remember Lot's wife? She left Sodom, but she had reservations. Her heart was back there. And, it, and she lost, and Lot lost all of her. Not only her heart, but everything. Okay? Do what Peter did. Peter repented and made himself available for service. Peter denied Christ three times, ran away like the rest of the disciples. But when he repented, he made himself available to God. Some of us need to do that. We've been going down a wrong road, and we know it's a wrong road, but uh, we're embarrassed or whatever it is. You don't have to talk to anybody. You just talk to God and say, look, I know I'm going down the wrong, wrong road. Please, show me a way out, and he will take care of it. Repent and serve. We can also do what Paul did. We can accept and live. Accept the forgiveness that Jesus provides. God is willing to give us wisdom and he's just as willing, even more willing, to forgive us if we just ask. Some of us are paralyzed by the mistakes that we've made. Utterly paralyzed. Yes, we are here every Sabbath. But the choices that we have made forms a barrier and the accuser of the brethren keeps coming back and doing his job, which he likes to do, accusing us and keeping us from being fully available to God. We can accept what God has to offer to us in terms of forgiveness and make ourselves available to God. I'll give you a text for that. We're not going to read it, but Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. The absolute wrong thing that one can do if we think we've made a wrong decision or we know that we've made a wrong decision and that is to remain on that course. 
we know it's headed down, you know it's not the, or even if it's not, it may not be a wrong decision, it may not be the best decision. You know it's not the best decision that you could have made, but you're going to stick with it because you don't want to, be, to admit that you made, did something wrong. Very bad thing to do. Pride or any other reason, let's change. And finally, if you've made a wrong decision, the last thing you want to do is to remain there and wallow. You know, in, um, in elementary school, I was always a tiny guy, skinny guy, and a uh, sickly person, go to school and get beat up and what have you until I learned certain remedies and that stopped. But <clears throat> anyhow, you get knocked down as a kid in the dirt and I learned that the last thing you want to do is to lay there and wallow. You know, you get up and do something. In my case, I got up and did something and they left me alone. But in this case, the same works as well. If we lie there and wallow with the devil taunting us and what have you, we are not available to do what God has called us to do. And that is the devil's whole objective, to keep us from being available to God, to be blessed, and to be the blessing that God intends for us to be. Now, my hope that is that this brief uh, encounter with the decision-making process and a few examples from such people like Lot and David and Daniel would teach us the importance of making better decisions, not just better decisions, but the absolute very best decision that we could make at each point in time. There are no inconsequential decisions. You may have heard me say this before, and I will keep saying it again. There are no small or inconsequential decisions for the children of God. This battle, this great controversy, this life that we live is like a big chess game. And we are the pieces on the chessboard. The difference is that we have a choice as to how we move, what benefit we will be. So we need to be able to make the very best decisions, and our only help comes from God. I hope that we will begin to be open today not tomorrow, not five minutes from now, but right now, today, as we sit here, that we would be open to the wisdom of God through his word and godly counsel from trustworthy brothers and sisters as we make life decisions. Today, it's, uh, you know, the whole world believe, believe that we are living in the time of the end. If we believe that, how much... How great is the importance that God's people should be making the very best decisions today? More than any other time in history, it's important that we make wise decisions, God-directed decisions. And there are lots of folk out there who are happy to give you their two or three cents worth. And they may have, they may have um, all sorts of agendas. Today, there's a big thing about... Um, the world is coming to an end. Go dig a hole and put all your possessions and, and buy guns and shoot anybody who comes and tries to take it away from you. But what does God say to us? God is preparing a kingdom for us. And he wants us to not only be prepared, but to help prepare others, to be available to him to help prepare others. The God we serve is not a God that is deaf, dumb, and blind. He knows all, he sees all, and he is quite capable, quite capable. The question for you and I, you and me, all of us today, is have we made the most important decision that we can ever make in this life? It's not a decision that we make once. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily. Some of us, all of us, need to make this decision every moment of every day, like Daniel and his pals. We need to make that decision every day so that when we are, 
when we, we need to make other decisions, we've already made the key foundational decision to allow God to be the boss of us, the boss of our lives. The decision will determine our eternal destiny. Eternity should mean something to us. How we plan to spend eternity will determine how we live today, day to day. The decision will allow Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. And we can safely allow God to do that because we serve a God who is immortal, he is all wise, he is great, and he is, all, he is almighty, and he's already gained the victory. All we need to do is to accept the victory that he offers us. In the words of our closing hymn, which is number 12, written by, the words were written by Walter Smith in 1876. Immortal, invisible, can't see him, but his power is there. We know his power by coming into his presence. God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, existing in eternity past and eternity future, existing in the present for us. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Let us get connected with God. Make that decision now. The baptismal vows that we made, that some of us may have reneged on along the way, we need to rekindle that decision. A decision we made to, be, to allow God to be the Lord of our lives and to be used by him in this church as well as outside the church in every aspect of our lives to glorify him and to be a blessing to others. Will you make that decision today? Father, 
We need to make wise decisions. We acknowledge that we've made wrong decisions in the past. Some of them we've been reasonably pleased with, but we know they aren't the best for us. Open our eyes, quicken our hearts and our minds that we may hear your word and discern your will for us because you want to lead us in the path of righteousness in all that we do. So Lord, we ask that you would leave us not nor forsake us at any time. As long as we are willing, we know that you will be with us in all our decisions. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.